Hey everybody, Paul Abernathy here. Welcome to another episode here where we're looking at the changes that are taking place to the National Electrical Code for the 2023 edition. Now, hopefully you've watched part one where we talked about Article 90, we talked about Article 100, and we talked about Article 110. So now we're gonna be moving into uh, Article 210. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't any significant changes that you might want to be aware of in Article 200. It's just that we're picking the things that are most significant uh, to keep these videos as concise as, as we can. I encourage you to always grab your code book, go look at Article 200. You'll see that a lot of it is verbose changes, nothing overly significant, at least in my mind. And I serve on that code panel that oversees Article 200. And I just didn't think it was enough to bring it to the video, but it doesn't mean I, you don't go look at it and, and kind of get an idea of what changes are taking place. I do want you to do that. Uh, the beautiful thing about the National Electrical Code is now that since they highlight the changes, uh, it's easy for you to go maneuver through it and look at it and say, oh, well, this is grayed out, so this must be a change. Okay, now if you have your old code book, you can go back and look at the old code book and you can see what has actually changed between the 2023 and the 2020. And that is something that, that all astute folks that are in the electrical industry, whether you're a journeyman, master, an engineer, uh, or an educator, we constantly do that. We go from the 2020 to the 23 as it's being adopted now in states. Uh, and that's how we can kind of analyze the different changes, of course. Of course, it also makes it easy if you have a link. So again, think about getting link because link from NFPA is an easy way to get the code book many many different cycles on your phone, on your laptop, on your desktop, on a tablet, and it works seamlessly across all of those platforms. So uh, go to nfpa.org and, and inquire about Link, uh, and you might be surprised at how much you fall in love with it, okay? All right, I know that I couldn't teach today without Link, so I am thankful uh, that we're finally are away from the PDFs and we're into something. I don't mind paying the 100 and $15 or $120 or whatever it is uh, for the annual membership because I think it's well worth it. And you have to remember on code making panels, we do get access to some of these documents in the NFPA website for free. I still prefer to pay for link because it just makes things so much easier. So something for you to consider. All right, so let's go on and look at the uh, changes in Article 210 that I want to call out during this episode. So let's go on and do that. All right, as you can see, there's a number of them on the screen here. We're gonna kind of look quickly at each one of them. Uh, maybe this episode will go fairly quickly, but this is episode two. If you haven't seen episode one, uh, you wanna go watch it. Uh, it talks about Article 90, talks about 100, and it talks about Article 110, okay? All right, again, by no means are we covering all of the changes. So just because I'm jumping into 10 doesn't mean there's nothing for you to go look at at Article 200. You really need to do that. All right, so what we're gonna start out with right here, the first thing we've got is, first one up here, right here, is reconditioned electrical, uh, reconditioned equipment pro, pro, uh, prohibitions have been relocated from Section 210.15, have now been moved to 210.2. So if you remember in the past, the dot two was used in different articles for specific definitions that were germane to that article. Um, that's all been moved to 100, if you saw in my part one series of this uh, code change. Um, that's where all the definitions are going now. So that frees up the dot two in many locations. So here, uh, the reconditioned equipment prohibitions uh, within 210 have been relocated. And so we'll go to the code and let you see that what's what it looks like and here you go right here here's 210.2 uh, you can see this little little diamond here beside it if you click on it if you happen to have link it'll pop up and you can see you know the differences right uh, that you might have so again this was in you know he had 210.15 it made reference to gfci equipment and all this kind of stuff right summary of the change you got that in link now as well it says relocated from 210.15, revised to eliminate redundancy, okay? So if you've got your 2020 edition of the NEC, uh, and, and I always keep one with me, if I go look at it, you know, you just happen to have it, if you're gonna do analysis, you go look at 210.2 in the 2020 edition, 
and you look at it and you'll notice that 210.2 wasn't there. There was no nothing there. But if you go to 210.15, that's where you would see it. So that dot two now gets moved over and now you've got your uh, information having to do with uh, reconditioning. So here's what it says. I'll just kind of get rid of this here. And you can see here it says reconditioned equipment. It says the following shall not be reconditioned. So if you remember from part one in our series, I talked about the new rules for reconditioning and what you had to do if it was a listed product for reconditioning or it was a product that not required to be listed. And then, of course, you had the HJ's method, which is item C, which is approval, right, that they could do that. Well, there are certain things, as we said, that just simply cannot be reconditioned. And this is where you're going to get this. So right here under 210, it says equipment that provides ground fault circuit interrupter protection for personnel. It just it just shall not be reconditioned. So not an option. Right? Uh, and then number two, it says equipment that provides arc fault circuit interrupter protection. Simply not um, allowed to be reconditioned. Uh, and you know what? It makes sense because if you think about this, if you think about it, it's all of the components and the reliability of the working parts, especially when GFCIs and AFCIs, thinking about how they're going to function if they've been exposed to a condition of use that's outside the scope of their evaluation, right? And, and are they going to work? And, and when people do that and they subject it to that, and then they try to recondition it, um, what is the guarantee that the, um, the technology is going to work? Remember, the manufacturer, Eaton, uh, Schneider, uh, Siemens, GE, and all those do a lot of extensive testing on these products. And then they put them out there. And if they get exposed to something where they're going to get reconditioned, um, how are they going to uh, vouch for the reliability of the components inside of it, right? If it's been exposed. So you really are not something that can be reconditioned when it comes to GFCIs and AFCIs. You're just going to replace it, okay? All right, so that's the, that's the change there. Uh, the real biggish thing here was the creation of dot two for this, and it was relocated by 210.15. So there you go. All right, let's get back to the code or the changes. Let's go to the changes. So the next one we're going to look at is the second one right here. All right, and that is the clarification of General requirements for multi-wire brand circuits. So 210.4a. So we're probably all familiar with what a multi-wire brand circuit is, right? So it is, if I run a 14.3 out uh, and I want to pick up, let's say, two bedrooms. Um, I got a black, a red, and a white. So I'm sharing the neutral uh, between these two bedrooms. Um, now, if it's a multi-wire brand circuit, then it is considered two circuits, um, the shared neutral, but you still have one of the ungrounded conductors, let's say the black sharing the white, and that's one circuit. And then, of course, you have, if you have a red in there, the red is sharing the white, white as well. And so that is also a separate circuit. Okay, So it is considered a multi-wire brand circuit. Okay, So we do have some additional clarity to that. Most people understand that, um, but we're going to go look at it. So we're going to look at 210.4a and see if we can't read what the significance of this change is or the clarification of this change. So we'll go on over. Uh, let's get on down here to it. Okay, so you see a lot of the uh, uh, yellowish, kind of tannish text in here, so there was some changes. Uh, let's see here. We're going to read it for context reasons and say, branch circuits are recognized by this article shall be permitted as multi-wire circuits. Okay, multi-wire brand circuit. A multi-wire circuit shall be permitted to be considered as multiple circuits. Absolutely. 14.3, two circuits. 12.3, two circuits. You're permitted to consider it that. Uh, it says, except as permitted in 300.3b4. Now, 300.3b4 is talking about column width panel boards and how you might have a panel board that's a column width. Uh, they're rare, but they're there. And you might have a junction box on top of it and all the neutrals don't come out of the actual panel board. They actually come out of the junction box on top of it. Probably a little more than the scope of our discussion today. But if you ever venture into um, column width type of panel boards, 
um, which are seen in a lot of high rise buildings and things like that. The neutrals don't always come out of the panel board. They many times will come out of the junction box that's connected it with an auxiliary gutter between the junction box and the panel board. Um, and so that's saying, except as permitted there, where you wouldn't have all the circuits running together, except as permitted there, where it allows you to come out the junction box instead of all the circuits out of the panel, it says, all conductors of a multi-wire brand circuit shall originate from the equipment containing the brand circuit overcurrent protected device or protected device. Okay, so, uh, and again, I can show you what we're talking about here. So here is 300.4, and that's a column width panel board. And again, you have some situations where your, your neutral's not gonna actually come out of the panel board. It's gonna come out of the box that's above it, okay? That type of thing. So other than that, you typically, all of your circuits in a multi-wire brand circuit will all run together. Your black, your red, your white, and would all originate from the same panel, right? So that's what we're dealing, and that's just reminding you and giving you a little clarity to that. Um, you do have these informational notes, they're still here, and that's to remind you, and I'll go on to remind you, that in a three-phase, four-wire, Y-connected system, uh, if you have a lot of harmonics, Okay, total harmonic distortion, you have a lot of uh, non-linear type of loads, uh, like fluorescent lighting, variable frequency drives, anything that can change or distort the waveform, uh, creating harmonics, then that neutral can carry as much, if not more current than the phase conductors, and that can be a problem, and that's why we have brownouts. So you need to understand a little bit more about that when you're selecting your circuits, but for most cases, a multi-wire brand circuit is just a black, a red, and a shared white. And for most all other applications where we're not dealing with high uh, harmonics or a bunch of non-linear type loads, then it's not, a, not an issue. A residential, for example, a residential application, you're not going to worry about any of those harmonic distortion. You're not, that's not going to be something you really take into consideration. Okay? But in a commercial building where you may be uh, dealing with a lot of harmonics, a lot of uh, electronic ballasts, a lot of uh, things that can disturb the waveform, then you got to be very careful when it comes to that neutral. Okay? So anyway, that's just some extra informational notes that are there. It also reminds you in the second one down here uh, in 300.13b, and that is the continuity of the grounded conductor. So when you have multi-wire branch circuits and you're bringing them into a junction box, you cannot leave the integrity of that grounded, shared, neutral grounded conductor. Uh, you cannot leave the integrity to connecting it to a device because you have to have something that even when the device is removed, the integrity of that stays intact. Okay, So that's something It just makes a reference to you. If you want to pause the video, go to 300.13b and kind of read it. But basically what we're saying is we don't want the grounded conductor to the linchpin for that to be on a device. So if somebody removes the vice, then it opens up the multi-wire brand circuit. Instead of having a shared neutral, now what you're going to have is a phase-to-phase -phase condition. And anything that's connected to that circuit that was originally supposed to get, let's say, uh, 120 will now get maybe 240 or 208, and then it will end up burning something up that was never intended to be anything more than 120. So that's why you have to maintain the integrity of the grounded conductor, and you can't use a device like a receptacle to be the connection point in a multi-wire brand circuit application like that. So that's what that's all about if you didn't know. Okay, all right, let's go back and look here. All right, so the next one we wanna look at is the expanded GFCI protection requirements for areas with sinks for food or beverage preparation. Okay, so we're not talking about a kitchen here. Um, the kitchen's pretty straightforward. We have a definition in Article 100 now where all of our definitions are located. And we're not talking about a kitchen. But we are expanding this now to other locations where you might have sinks and you might have food preparation. Okay, so let's go on and look at it. So this is 210.8A7, and we'll go look at it, okay? So you go down and look at 210.8, and let's see here, here's eight, and we're gonna look at A7. So here's A7, right here, and it says areas, okay, now notice that we have the one up here for kitchens, okay? We get that. Um, I will tell you what's significant with that, is you'll notice that for dwelling units now, that when it says kitchens, it's not specific to what? Uh, it's all receptacles in a kitchen, 
Now, granted, we have the ones that are installed within six feet from the top inside edge of the bowl or sink, but when you see kitchens, it's pretty straightforward that, again, 125 volt through 250 volt receptacles installed in the following locations and supplied by single phase brand circuits rated 150 volts or less to ground uh, shall be ground fault circuit interrupter protection for personnel. So you see kitchens, it's broad. All receptacles in the kitchen now are gonna be located on GFCI protection, okay? Now here, it just reminds you that areas that are, you know, that have sinks, uh, could be a wet bar location or whatever, and permanent provisions, okay, for food preparation, beverage preparation, or cooking. So again, so it has to be an area with a sink and permanent provisions for either food prep, beverage prep, or cooking, is going to require the receptacles in that area to be GFCI protected. Right? So that is new uh, for 2023. Now you could say that most of those areas were probably covered by this one right here, sinks. It says where receptacles are installed within six feet of the top inside edge of the bowl of the sink required the GFCI protection. Um, but again, um, what about those receptacles that were further than six feet? but they're still there for the area that has a sink and permanent provisions for food preparation um, uh, or beverage preparation or cooking is now going to require uh, GFCI protection. Now remember, we're doing dwelling units, so don't let the mind wander yet. We haven't looked at anything in B yet, which is other than dwellings, okay? Um, and of course, now you've also got uh, some of the exceptions here and we're gonna look at each one of these. Now, some of these aren't new, some of them just has been relocated, because you remember, before they were kind of embedded in the list, and now they're kind of all at the end right now, all right? So that's okay, so we're only gonna look at, so far right now, we're just looking at number seven, which is the area, so that's been added, okay? All right, let's go back. All right, so the next one is, all right, now we are gonna kind of dabble in those exceptions, okay? This one says a new exception says for GFCI protection for listed weight supporting ceiling receptacles for ceiling luminaires or ceiling suspended fans in dwelling units. That's 210.8A3 exception. Okay, so it's 210.8A exception number three. So let's go look at that in the code right here. All right. So we're kind of expanded a little bit. Uh, and let's see here, that, that didn't cover that one. So I was kind of hoping I'd get a graphic for you, uh, but I'm not gonna, so we're gonna come back to me. Okay, so what are these devices? Uh, there is a vid video um, image of those out there in the internet, you can Google it and find it. Um, but basically you have the receptacle, which is more or less the female end that mounts at the junction box or at the device box, I should say, device box. Uh, and then you have the male version, that actually mounts onto the luminaire, onto the ceiling fan. And it has little prongs on it, they circle around it, they're kind of just like a receptacle. I mean, they are a receptacle, um, but it will plug into the female. So the male will mate into the female and it's designed to support the weight. So if you put these in, in this case, with the exception, it's reminding you that these are not required to be GFCI protected, okay? These receptacles are not, unlike other applications, wherever it would be required in 210.8a to have GFCI protection. If you installed one of these in those locations that typically will require all receptacles in there to be GFCI protected, you wouldn't have to worry about for this device. Even though it is a receptacle, the way it's designed and the way it mates designed to hold ceiling fans and luminaires and things like that, heavy luminaires, uh, that was an exception. Those do not have to be GFCI protected. Um, I have not, I mean, I only know of a couple manufacturers that might be utilizing these. It's a proprietary system. Um, but again, you can go look on the internet and you can find them. Uh, but those receptacles, that system is not required to be GFCI protected. Okay. All right. So let's go back to me. Go back to the code here. Look at another change. All right. So the next one exception is this one right here. So this one, a new exception for GFCI protection uh, for factory installed receptacles that are mounted internally to bathroom exhaust fans, 
A, exception number four. So we'll go to the code and we'll highlight that one. All right, so here's the exception right here. And it says a factory installed receptacle that are not readily accessible and are mounted internally to bathroom exhaust fan assemblies shall not require GFCI protection unless required by the installation instructions or the listing. Okay, so what does that mean? So I'm sure you've all seen the exhaust fans that mount in the ceiling. So you don't, you know, you don't, you have to take a ladder to get to it. So it's not readily accessible. So they mount it and inside of its assembly has a little, as a receptacle. Now, if we didn't have this rule, you could have somebody that would come along and say, well, that is a receptacle that's in the bathroom, let's say, because bathroom is in our list. Uh, of locations that all receptacles require GFCI protection. And they say, you know, that's a receptacle. Yes, I know you're plugging in the fan component into it, but it is still a receptacle and I want it GFCI protected. Now, if the manufacturer of that exhaust fan states that if you put it in a certain area that it has to be GFCI protected, then okay, the manufacturer has spoken. And like it says here, if it's part of their instructions um, or their listing, then, uh, it's going to have to be GFCI protected. Now, if it doesn't say it, then this is telling you that that exhaust fan does not have to put, you do not have to have that on a GFCI. Okay, so that's the exception that it's getting here. Um, most of the exhaust fans that I've ever installed are in a, in a bathroom. They're certainly not readily accessible. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a receptacle but it's in high, housed inside of the assembly for the exhaust fan. Uh, and I never really gave that any consideration as a usable type receptacle, to be honest with you. Usually it's just two prong, not three prong. Um, so uh, when I say that, it's still grounded. It still has an equipment ground run to it. It's just terminated inside of the housing area. Um, but um, I never really thought about that having to be uh, GFCI protected because uh, it wasn't typically you wouldn't put that in the shower area or anything like that. So, um, but if a manufacturer wants it to be GFCI protected, it has to be. But this exception says in and of itself is not required to put that receptacle that's part of that assembly on GFCI, if not necessary. Okay. All right, let's go back. We're moving along pretty good. All right. So the next one right here. So this one is expanded GFCI protection requirements in other than dwelling units, including areas with sinks for food uh, or beverage preparation, buffets, uh, buffet, when I say buffet, like Jimmy Buffett, uh, buffet serving areas and aquariums and bait wells. So as you can see here, there was a change to B3, B4, and B13 was added here. So let's go look and see what it is. And now you notice we're in B. So we're now we're dealing with other than dwelling units. Okay, so let's go there. So here is B right here, other than dwelling units. Okay, so we've got that. Um, so you see kitchens. You see here's the areas with sinks and permanent provisions for food preparation. So that was over added to A. So now it's added here. Here's your buffet serving areas with permanent provisions for food serving, beverage, serving, or cooking. So your receptacles that are located in your buffet area. Um, here you've got sinks, and you notice that it added, we didn't talk about this one, it really wasn't in there, but here it says sinks where receptacles or cord and plug connected fixed or stationary appliances are installed within six feet of the top inside edge of the bowl of the sink. So now, it, if you have a sink, the receptacles or or any cord and plug connected fixed or stationary appliances are installed within six feet from the top inside edge of the bowl of the sink is going to require GFCI protection. Remember, we're not in dwellings anymore. We're in other than dwellings. So I have to sometimes mention that because sometimes people will listen to this and forget where we're at. And it, it can happen. And they think that this is something for residential. It's not. Okay. This is a other than other than dwelling application. Uh, and then, of course, um, down here, uh, you notice, OK, here is so indoor damp or wet locations. OK, kind of both locations. OK, this or that. Now, here's 13. And here's where it talks about the aquariums 
Uh, bait wells, you know, like a, me and my wife like to fish a lot. We have bass boat and we go fishing. She's a much better fisherman than I am. I can promise you that. Um, I, I guess to be politically co co uh, correct, I'd have to say fisher woman. And uh, she can really bass fish and she loves it. Of course, she's got about an 18 years jump on me on fishing, bass fishing. Um, but if you were to go to uh, 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 on the wharf or you go fishing, you pull up and you go and you're getting bait. Okay, well, there's receptacles there. And again, it's those receptacles where they're six feet, okay, where receptacles are installed within six feet from the top inside edge or, or rim or from the conductive support framing of the vessel or container to which, let's say, the, the aquariums are in or the bait tanks are in or whatnot. So um, aquarium, bait wells, and similar, okay, maybe a similar could be, maybe it's some... Um, Maybe it's a breeding tank for fish, things like that, okay? So all those type of applications, and if the receptacles where there are six feet from the top inside edge rim of the con conductive support framing uh, or of the, ve of the vessel uh, or container, then guess what? You got a nail, watch where these receptacles go because you are gonna have things like aerators on these tanks and all this other stuff on the tank. So now, if your receptacle is going to be within six feet of that, then you're gonna to have to, to do some GFCI protection for that. Now, that makes sense. People are reaching in those things all the time. So again, uh, fishing out bait, uh, maybe it's an aquarium, uh, maybe it's a pet store where they're uh, pulling out you know, little fish or something like that, little neon tetras or whatnot. We, we have to protect those that are working with it. So. Again, makes sense, okay? All right, now, the exceptions, you have uh, a, you know, a few more that were added here, but uh, generally it's the, the same kind of application. Here you see receptacles, there's an exception here. Now, exception number four, it says, receptacles or cord and plug connected fixed or stationary appliances installed within six feet of the top inside edge of the bowl of a sink shall not be required. Remember, the rule required it, but it says it shall not be required to be GFCR protected in, now this is specific, in industrial laboratories where the receptacle is used to supply equipment if removal of power would reduce, uh, would introduce a greater hazard. So, if I have a situation where I have a cord and plug connected appliance or stationary or fixed appliance that's cord and plug, and I, the general rule would acquire that to be on GFCI protection within six feet, right? But if it would increase the hazard by putting it on GFCI, so maybe I'm having some kind of experiment that I'm plugging into that, and if the GFCI were to trip, then you could have this catastrophic chain reaction that takes place because of what I've got plugged into it. Oh, okay, if that's the case, then don't put it on the GFCI, right? Uh, that's a, it's a greater hazard to have it on the GFCI than to not have it on the GFCI. That's, that's what it's talking about. Uh, and all the other ones are the, still the same here, uh, generally. So again, I'm not gonna go into all of these changes, but just be aware of them. Notice how they're now have been added after all of the items that are in 210.8a and 210.8b. So just kind of take that into consideration uh, as you look at it. All right, let's go on back. Okay, the next one we're gonna look at in this edition here is the revised or expanded branch circuit or outlet GFCI protection requirements for specific appliances. Okay. So this one's probably a biggie for most people, and you probably heard me talk about it, but what's happened is 210.8D has been totally redone, and now it's gonna list specific appliances that are going to require GFCI protection, okay? Uh, so let's go look at it, because the list is quite significant, and it's gonna be very impactful for folks out there uh, that are uh, just starting to dip their toe in the 2023 edition, uh, these are going to be some locations that you've never seen before. Uh, now, I'm again, I'm just the messenger. I don't necessarily possibly agree with all of these, but again, um, I'm not on that code panel. I didn't go back and overly research the justification. It just is what it is. So I'm going to share them with you now. So this is 210.8D1 through 12. So let me go over here. All right, so here's D right here. So here's your specific appliances. 
Okay, so you've got your location specific stuff in 210.8a and b, right? Um, and so now we're talking about specific appliances that the GFCI requirements are going to cater to here. So GFCI protection shall be, okay, that's a mandatory statement, provided for the branch circuit or outlet supplying the following appliances rated 150 volts or less to ground and 60 amperes or less single or three phase. Okay, so uh, single or three phase, it doesn't matter. It's 150 volts or less to ground. So in a 240 volt system, y'all know that one leg to ground is 120, right? In a 12208 system, again, it's 150 volts or less to ground. So you just simply take one of the legs to ground. If that is 150 volts or less, then it's going to have to be GFCI protected. Okay, it's not phase to phase. So here you've got automotive vacuum machines, not new, not, not new. Uh, drinking water coolers, but the bottle fill stations is something that uh, you see at a lot of the gyms now uh, that you go, you fill up, and they're usually filtered water, things like that. So that's going to require the GFCI protection. Um, high pressure spray washing air uh, machines, uh, tire inflation machines, vending machines. Now, we don't have a definition of vending machine anymore. It uses the actual standard that defines a vending machine. Um, but let me tell you, the gist is you put something in, you get something out. It's a vending machine. Um, sump pumps. And I'll mention this now. 210.AD is not specific to residential or commercial. It's broad. It covers both. So, you know, when somebody looks at it and goes, well, sump pump, that's crazy. I'm not going to put the sump pump in my basement uh, on it. And, you know, if it's an unfinished basement and that receptacle is required to be GFCI in the basement, but maybe it's a finished basement or unfinished, you know, the 2020 introduced in dwellings that it has to be GFCI protected anyway in basements. It didn't care whether or not it was finished or unfinished, right? Y'all familiar with that one? It came to be in 2020. Well, same thing. It's still that way. But if you have a sump pump now, it, you don't have to have that argument on whether or not the receptacle has to be it or not. It's irrelevant now. 210.AD mandates that the sump pumps have to be GFCI protected. Okay? So there's your sump pump. Here's your dishwasher. Again, commercial or residential. Doesn't matter. Uh, now, here's where we start to get to the more, I guess, controversial ones for folks. Um, is electric ranges, uh, wall-mounted cooking ovens, counter-mounted cooking units, cooktops, clothes dryers, and microwave ovens. So now, it, you know, it's not somebody looking at a kitchen, right? And going, well, you know, that microwave uh, receptacle might be within six feet of the sink. Does it have to be GFCI protected? Well, doesn't matter now. Microwave ovens will be GFCI protected. Then somebody might say, well, didn't the rule change in the dwelling that every receptacle in the kitchen has to be GFCI protected now? And you go, yeah, well, microwave receptacles in there. But the importance of this, that it could be hardwired microwave oven is going to still require GFCI protection. Remember, when they say outlet up here, they're not talking about a receptacle. They're talking about the box to which the receptacle or the actual home run, the branch circuit, comes to and then maybe hardwired to a piece of to an appliance. Uh, that's the outlet. So this is huge. Now, remember, these residential or commercial doesn't matter. This is not calling out only for one and two family dwellings, and it's not only calling out other than dwelling units. It's broad. OK, so that's significant for the 2023 edition of the National Electrical Code. Okay. All right, let's come back here. Next, we'll look at a new requirement, right? Oops, I don't know why that keeps doing that. Right here, a, where are we at? Right here. A new requirement for providing GFCI protection for outdoor outlets, uh, replacement in garages, accessory buildings, and boathouses, okay? Now, so, the rule was still there in the 2020. It was a bit controversial. Um, there had this issue where um, mini split a, uh, air conditioning units were causing problems with GFCIs. And then you had a, a temporary halt to that. 
Um, and then they set a sunset date so manufacturers can resolve their issues. Um, it was causing uh, GFCIs to trip. Now, this first started uh, when they didn't want to enforce this was in Texas, where they were concerned the heat of Texas, if you used a mini split or, or some kind of air conditioning unit and it caused it to trip, uh, then the problem was uh, if it was on GFCI, then it wouldn't reset and then people would probably die of heat stroke than, than it is to be the concern of it not being GFCI protected. So they came up with a, a temporary amendment to it and said, you know what? You don't have to protect it with GFCI. Now that had a sunset date on it and give the manufacturers time to resolve the issue, okay? So anyway, let's go on and look at it and I'll show you what 210.8F, and when they, talk, when they talk about replacement, uh, that's probably the more significant in a sense that if you go back and you replace something, one of those items in those locations, and guess what? You're gonna have to add that GFCI protection. So this is more of a replacement rule, but I wanna show you the whole code uh, section so you get an understanding. So let's go to the code. And we're going to look at, let me scroll down here. Here it is, right here, here's F. Now I wanna, I wanna make an important statement here. Um, when this says outdoor outlets, Again, and most of you know this, but we're not talking about just receptacles, right? Um, outdoor outlets is the point, if you go look at the definition of outlets, the point where we take power from the system, right? So it's much more than just an outdoor receptacle because we already have normal 15 to 28 receptacles outdoor. We already have that requirement in 210.8a. We, we've got that. But this is more significant to this. Now, again, I want you to see this. It says for dwelling for dwellings. Okay, so it's applicable to dwellings. It says all outdoor outlets other than those that are covered in 210.8a exception number one. So we're not talking about snow melting, de-icing, those type of things. We're not talking about that. Um, it says and it says including outlets installed in the following locations. That's these down here and supplied by single phase brand circuits, again, rating 150 volts or less to ground, 50 amps or less shall be provided with GFCI protection, okay? So again, it reminds us that it says all outdoor locations other than those covered in 210.8A1, uh, excuse me, 210.8A exception number one, including outlets installed in the following locations, okay? So again, outlets that are installed in these locations, plus it also covers all outdoor outlets as well, okay? So I wanna make that real clear. Because some people will get confused and they say, well, does that only apply if we're in the garages, the accessory buildings and boat houses? No, no, this also applies to your outside air conditioning unit where you might have an outlet there that, that supplies power down to your air conditioning unit, okay? It might be 50 amperes or less, probably will be, Okay, and it probably will be 150 volts or less to ground on any one of the legs. So this is going to be applicable. But again, it also applies to these locations as well. Okay, that's how it's written. All right. So garages that have floors located at or below grade level, GFCI protection. Okay. Um, accessory buildings again uh, meeting this criteria. Then those outdoor outlets. And the outlets are located here are going to be GFCI protected, okay? And then, of course, in boat houses. And this could apply even if it was hardwired or there was a receptacle in the application, okay? I just want to make that clear that when you see the word outlet, we are not specifically pigeonholing it into a receptacle device, okay? Hopefully, you understand what we're talking about. Um, I run a branch circuit to a junction box. That junction box is the outlet. Now, whether I put a receptacle in it, it becomes a receptacle outlet box, okay? Uh, or maybe I'm dropping out of it to feed us an appliance. It is still an outlet. I'm taking power from it to feed the appliance, okay? Or piece of equipment, okay? Just wanna make that clear. Now, here is the part that we're calling out is the more significant change here is, is if, Equipment supplied by an outlet 
covered under this under the requirements of this section. So if it falls under this section, it says, and it is replaced. It says the outlet shall be supplied with GFCI protection. Okay, so typically in this case, if it was an outlet and you're taking it from the outlet box, uh, then what it would be is you're probably going to have a, a GFCI in the panel, something like that. Now, looking at the exceptions, because the one exception does address the HVAC equipment issue that everybody had down in uh, and, and, and down near Houston area, I think, or Austin area, somewhere in Texas, they had this issue. Um, first exception says GFCI protection shall not be required. For lighting outlets, other than those covered in 210.8C, which is the lighting outlets in a crawl space. So this doesn't apply to the lighting outlets that are outside that are illuminating your entry, right? Those are outlets. They're lighting outlets. But that's not the one that it's talking about in this rule. So it's just telling you, hey, don't worry about the lighting outlets there, okay? Um, all the other outlets out there, you got to worry about, but not the lighting outlets. Um, but of course, you still have to follow the rules in 210.8C, which is the crawl space lighting outlets being GFCI protected. Uh, now, number two is the one that was part of the issue that they had. And then they put out a statement about it and it was released. And here is how it made it into the 2023. It says GFCI protection shall not be required for listed HVAC equipment, okay? This exception. So this is telling you if your AC, HVAC equipment is listed, okay, whatever standard it may be, then this says this, is, this exception to GFCI protection exists. But the sunset date on this exception, so exception number two is here until September 1st, 2026. And that is typically probably around the time that the 2026 NEC is going to come out. And so the thought here is that the manufacturers with their problems, with their leakage current problems, with their HVAC equipment is going to get resolved by this time. Okay. And uh, they're charged with the duty of getting it resolved. Right. Okay. So here also, again, if you want to know what an outlet is, because people see the term outlet and they use the term outlet synonymous with receptacles all the time. And that's not really what it is. If you want to look at outlet, I'll click it. And here's what it is. It's a point on the wiring system to which current is taken to supply utilization equipment. So if I can run it to a junction box and I'm coming out of it with a pigtail, let's say, or a whip in order to feed an appliance, that junction box is the outlet point. That's where we're taking the power from. Okay. All right. Remember, that's in Article 100. You can go back and look at it. Okay. Let's go back to our stuff here that we're going through. Okay. So the next one we're going to look at is clarification of the permitted use of 15 ampere brand circuits in garages. Okay. So this is 110.11C4. This is also... Uh, was clarified in the previous cycle too when it came to bathrooms as well. Same kind of concept. Um, it was misconstrued that in a bathroom, for example, that you could only bring brand circuits that are 20 amps. And let's say you had a bidet and you had a receptacle just for the bidet and I wanted to bring a 15 amp circuit for it. Uh, many people argued you couldn't do that. They all had to be 20 amp. And that's not what the code was trying to say. It may have been what people interpreted that, but it had to change over time. That wasn't the intent. OK, but I get it. If it's not in the code in an earlier cycle, then you can't give people permission to do something that's not in the code. And that's the struggle that AHJs have. But it's been added and clarified over the years. In the last cycle, it was made very clear that, yes, I have to have at least one a 20 amp circuit in a garage, just like in a laundry, serving those those sink receptacles. Right. But I could have other circuits in there and they didn't have to be 20. Okay. So now it's the same here for the garage. Um, I do have to have a minimum of one 20 amp brand circuit to supply the receptacles for each vehicle bay. And again, you could have just one 20 amp supplying all those receptacles if you want. But what this is clarifying is that, you know what, if I want to bring another circuit to that garage and say it's only 15 amps, that's OK. Perfectly fine. Now, it's in the garage, still going to be GFCI protected, but we're talking more about the circuit at this point. So let's go to 210.11C4 and look at that. 
So here's 210.11, and here's C, right? And you have C1, 2, 3, and here's C4. And you'll see right here that, again, this is the language that we had in the, uh, pretty much didn't change, no, no exceptions here, they've changed everything. And this is for the bathroom that I was talking about earlier, right? Um, so here, garages, very specific language here. It says, in addition to the number of brand circuits required by other parts of the section, and those other brand circuits, by the way, are these up here. The, long, uh, the small appliance, laundry, and the bathroom, right? That type of thing. It says, in addition to those numbers of those that are required, um, it says, at least one 20 ampere brand circuit shall be installed to supply receptacle outlets, okay? Remember, that's the receptacle outlets, the box, the receptacle device goes in it, including those, listen, including those required by 210.52 G1 for attached garages and in detached garage with electric power, this circuit shall have no other outlets. So why is this significant? Well, if you look at G1, right, these are the one that says you have to have at least one receptacle outlet supplied for each vehicle bay. So it's three car garage. I have to have one within the footprint of each vehicle bay. Okay. So that would be a three car garage. I'd have to have three receptacles. Okay. So basically, and they can't be higher than five and a half feet. Why? Because they need to service that vehicle bay. But here it's telling me that that one 20 amp brand circuit installed to supply the receptacles that are in 210.52 G1 which is the ones that are around for the vehicle bays and in detached garages with electric power. Okay. It's now telling me that additional branch circuits rated 15 amperes or greater shall be permitted to, to serve receptacle outlets other than those required by 210.52 G1. So what we're saying is that I can bring my circuit in here to supply those receptacles that are required for each vehicle bay. Okay, that's 210.52 G1 requirement. So that's fine. But if I want to bring in additional branch circuits, right? And it could be 15 amperes or greater. I could bring a 15 amp in there now. Uh, and I think this is something that we probably already did when we had things like in the, in the garage, we would have central vac and there was only a 15 amp. And, you know, inspectors would poo-poo on that and say, no, again, they're all got to be 20 and you know that type of thing so anyway this makes it very clear um it also i like this subtle language in here now i'm going to read it to you slowly it says at least one 20 amp brand circuit shall be installed to supply receptacle outlets okay including those required by 210.52 g1 so why why is this significant the way this language is well this is going to give you the permission to not only do those receptacles in each vehicle bay, but that at least one 20 amp brand circuit can also supply the receptacles for like garage door openers as well on the same circuit. Now that wasn't necessarily the way you could do it in previous cycles. And it kind of waffled back and forth from when you could do it, then it language and you couldn't do it. And now it's back to saying, okay, you can do it. Okay, so it went from 2017 to 2020 to back to now to 2023, takes you back to where it's okay. If you want to put it on there, that's fine. The, the, the chances of the garage door opener being used at the same time you have any type of significant loads on those receptacles for each vehicle bay um, are slim. So with the diversity involved, we're, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna be okay with it. Okay, now it still reminds you no other, uh, no, the circuit shall supply no other outlets. So still can't do the lighting, okay? It's got a separate circuit for the lighting. Uh, but when it comes to the receptacles, now you could put the garage door openers with uh, receptacles on with the ones that supply the vehicle base and you'd be okay. But this is also giving you permission to do what? This is giving me permission to bring another 15 ampere or greater brand circuit into that garage if I choose. Okay. Um, now, another interesting change here that they don't talk about is something that's very similar uh, in a bathroom, uh, for example. Whereas if I was serving a bathroom um, and I had the lighting and the receptacles and it was one brand circuit and it doesn't leave the bathroom, then I can put the lighting and the receptacles on one 20 amp brand circuit, right? Um, and that's a specific allowance, and I'll show you that up here. 
and that's for bathrooms. So we're not, not a change. That's right here. So that's the exception right here. So it says where the 20 amp circuit supplies a single bathroom outlets for other equipment, lighting outlets. Okay. Make it easy for you. Lighting outlets within the same bathroom shall be permitted to be supplied in accordance with 210.23 B1 and B2. So that is depends on whether or not it's cord and plug connected or fixed, whether it's 50% or 80%. So the key here is I can put everything in there on that 20 amp brand circuit, the lighting and the receptacles that are required to be within three feet of the sink, right? Well, the same thing now is for garages. If you have a single car garage, it's just one car garage, then you have an exception now right here. It says where the 20 amp branch circuit or the 20 amp circuit supplies a single vehicle bay garage, outlets for other equipment, i.e. lighting outlets, okay, within the same garage shall be permitted to be supplied in accordance with 210.23 B1 and B2. And again, B1 and B2 have to do with the 50% or 80% limitation, depending on what you're dealing with. So um, the key thing here, is that if it's a single car garage, the exceptions now, let me just run one circuit in there and I can pick up the lighting and the receptacles if I want, perfectly fine. Again, has to be a garage with only one vehicle bay to be able to do this exception, right? Uh, let's see here. Now, bathroom, I just wanna clarify again for everybody. In addition to the number of brand circuits required by other parts of this section, and again, that's these up here. It says one or more 20 amp your branch circuits shall be provided to supply bathroom receptacle outlets required by 210.52D, and that's receptacles to serve the sink countertop, and, and any countertop or similar work surface receptacle outlets. So it could def most certainly pick up other receptacle outlets that are serving on a countertop that are not, again, within three feet of the sink. It could pick those up. As well in there okay um, but the other thing that I want to make really clear is nothing in here would prohibit you from obviously running another branch circuit to that bathroom the only thing is it will need to be GFCI protected because it is in the bathroom okay all right so let's get back here And let's go here. So we've got that. Let's go on to the next one. So right here, let's talk a little AFCI, you know, one of our favorite topics here. Uh, it says revised requirements for AFCI protection in dwelling units, dormitory units, and other occupancies. So 210.12A through D has been changed. So let's go on and look and see what we've got here. All right. So here you can see how it's broken out now. So 210.12A, uh, and here's your A, and it's giving your, you still have your, your six options, okay, for protection, okay? So the means of protection, so we're gonna give you the different ways to do it, combination type, AFCIs, a listed branch feeder with a combination type of uh, AFCI branch type or listed uh, outlet branch type AFCI at the first outlet, okay, makes sense. Um, still had the supplemental protection, arc protection. Uh, still got to use a listed outlet type brand circuit at, you know, at the first outlet box. Got it. Still have all the other, everything else is here didn't really change. Okay. Uh, but now you'll notice that B, which is for dwelling units, gives you all of these locations. Now you will notice it says all 120 volts, single phase, 10, 15, and 20. So it does bring in the tin. Uh, I will tell you, there's really no wiring methods that have been approved for use at 10 amps anyway right now uh, for these type of dealing with receptacles in uh, our lighting outlets inside of a dwelling unit. Um, but if the you get any, then the 10 amps is gonna be under this now. Um, so it's 10, 15 and 20 amp branch circuits. And you see all of the locations here. So they're pretty much the same. Uh, now, here you're going to see for dormitory units, okay? Again, the 10 was added, and then the following location. So in dormitory units, it's now the bedrooms, living rooms, hallways, 
closets, closets being very broad, utility closet, clothes closet, all of them. Uh, bathrooms and similar rooms similar to these, okay? Or it could be uh, interpreted as a similar room, then it's going to uh, require uh, AFCI protection, okay? And then you've got other occupancies, that is D now, and it says all 120 volt single phase 15, uh, excuse me, 10, 15, and 20 in the following locations are going to have to have the AFCI protection. So you've got guest rooms and guest suites of hotels and motels, AFCI protection. Number two is areas used exclusively for patient sleeping rooms in nursing homes and limited care facilities. So that's kind of new. If you're in a nursing home or limited care uh, facility, um, all of these can be easily defined in NFPA's uh, 99 document. Um, but if you do have one of these locations, these patient sleeping areas and the receptacles there are all the branch circuits, I should say, not receptacles, all the branch 120 volt branch circuits supplying, whether it's the lighting or receptacles or whatnot, in those patient sleeping areas are going to have to be AFCI protected. Okay. And then number three, it says areas design, uh, designed for ex uh, exclusively as sleeping quarters in fire stations, police stations, ambulance stations, rescue stations, ranger stations, and other similar locations, uh, you know, whatever might be similar uh, to that. Um, and again, that is the areas that are exclusive for sleeping, maybe the sleeping quarters. So your lighting, your receptacles, all those are going to be AFCI protected in those areas. Um, and again, we're not talking about the uh, open areas, uh, we're talking just the ones that are used exclusively as sleeping areas for these types of locations are going to have to have AFCI protection, okay? So new for 2023, a little more AFCI expansion. Uh, but again, uh, the, the support when you're supporting that, you're basically saying sleeping quarters, that's where people are sleeping and they're unaware of their surroundings. Some people are heavier sleeper than other. Um, and you want to give them a fighting chance in, in getting out. Uh, so again, at the end of the day, it's exclusively for sleeping areas in the item three. Okay. All right. The next one we'll look at is, and again, we kind of covered, I guess at the same time, we kind of covered all of these, but uh, let's see here. Um, let's go on now to expand, expanded branch circuit requirements for guest rooms and guest suites in assisted living facilities. So 210.17, okay, so we'll go look at that now. All right, so this is for guest room and guest suites. And I guess the significant difference here, right, is if we go back to this one, this was dormitory units, this is other, and this is talking about the AFCI in the guest rooms and guest suites of hotels and motels, okay? So when we look at 17, 17 says guest room and guest suites uh, in the following occupancies that are provided with permanent provisions of cooking shall have branch circuits installed to meet the rules for dwelling units. Okay, so what is this? So we went from a GFCI requirement for guest room, guest suites, to now we're at a requirement to make sure that we understand that the receptacles, the required branch circuits, the spacing rules in 210.52, like the six and 12 foot rules, the countertop rules. Now we're getting something that's going to remind us and say, okay, I, I need you to be very clear, all right, that, and this was always the case for hotels and motels, right? If you go into a motel and a hotel, you need to make sure that you lay out the receptacles and maybe the spacing is a little different when you get to 210.52 for hotels and motels, but the number of them doesn't change. Okay, so it's the same whether you're doing the six foot, 12 foot layout rule. If you needed eight receptacles, well, ultimately when you get to 210.52, you can put them where you want them pretty much. Um, two of them have to be accessible, right? But you can put them wherever you want in the room. You still have to have eight of them. You just essentially put them where you want. So this is just reminding you that, look, when you're dealing with hotels, motels, and now assisted living facilities, that you're gonna do what, okay? 
you're going to treat them like the same way you would for a dwelling unit, okay? Treat it the same requirements, minimum of this and that, spacing, and you know, basically treat it like a dwelling unit, okay? That's all it's stating. Now, it does have some informational note here that says 210.11c2 and 210.52f, exception number two for information, uh, for information on laundry branch circuits and receptacle outlets. So again, you could go there, you'll get other information. You maybe have an offsite or maybe there's a laundry facility, things like that. So I guess it gives you some extra guidance on that. All right, let's get back. The, the significance of that was the inclusion of assisted living facilities that basically says you got to follow the rules as if it was a dwelling unit for those assisted living facilities. That, that's the significance of that change. All right, so the next one is a new provision for permitted use of 10 amp branch circuits. That's 210.23A1 and A2. Now, I will tell you right now, it is a permitted use, but uh, there is no um, wire methods, wiring methods that would allow for this right now. Uh, and it may change. But right now, there isn't going to be any significant use for building wiring for a 10 amp branch circuit. Okay. So again, I, I fully expect that to change, uh, but right now it's not there. It also was limited to lighting outlets or specific loads where you controlled the actual load. You couldn't use it for 10 amp circuit, brand circuit. You couldn't use for receptacles and things like that. Uh, but that's ever changing. And I'm sure in the 2026, there'll be some more on that as well. But just be aware that there is a now a 10 amp brand circuit. And we'll go look at it, 210.23a. So here you see, now this was made reference earlier. You saw it talked about 210.23. Um, and so here you go, loads that are permitted on a 10 amp brand circuit, you know, lighting outlets, dwelling unit, exhaust fans and bathrooms and laundry room lighting circuits. Uh, and of course, a gas fireplace unit supplied by an individual brand circuit of 10 amps. So you have some allowances here for these new 10 amps brand circuits. Okay. But there also does tell you things that are not permitted on it. And what's not permitted right here okay, uh, is receptacle outlets, fixed appliances, except as permitted for individual brand circuits. Again, all very load specific. You got to know the load to know whether or not you could use it. Uh, garage door openers cannot be on these 10 amp brand circuits. And of course, laundry equipment of any kind cannot be uh, on these new 10 amp brand circuits. Um, again, so it's very limited. Uh, and again, you'll, you're gonna be hard pressed to find any wiring method at this time uh, that's gonna allow for a 10 amp application. Uh, but again, it's, it's probably coming down the road. So just you know, be aware of it and just be uh, conscious of the fact that that has been introduced into the 2023 edition of the NEC, okay? All right. The next one we're gonna look at is this one here. This is, oops, I don't know why that keeps doing that, is the revised requirements for receptive outlets intended to serve islands and peninsular countertops and work surfaces. Okay. All right, I have done a fair share of commentary on this. Um, and there are some people out there that have done some commentary and you know, I respect them highly, but I kind of disagree with it. Um, I remember back in the day when there was a lot of arguments to put receptacles on the islands and peninsulas, uh, and there was a lot of justification of people pulling things off with extension cords and people getting hurt. And I heard the same story. Um, and so then we ended up changing the islands and peninsulas for the number of receptacles and it kept growing and it, it went from, uh, have to have one for every 12 by 24. It means if you put like a cooktop in the middle and broke an island in half, if the left side was at least 12 by 24 and the right side was at least 12 by 24, then you had to have a receptacle on either side that constituted two separate islands, right? Kind of. Um, well, we saw that change in the 2020 code where it was all based on square footage. So the first nine uh, fraction thereof, nine square feet or fraction thereof, uh, required one. And then every 18 or fraction thereof after that, kind of in lumps, you know, first nine and then the next 18, 
would require one and then the next 18 and then the next 18, you know? Um, so you could end up with a bunch of receptacles on an island and kind of remember that as being the, the reason we did it. Um, during the 2023 cycle, there was a lot of people that um, put out a, a lot of warnings about kids that were hurt and people that have died from things spilling off of counters. Uh, I'm going to remind you, though, folks, that there are people that die every day from falling down the stairs, falling backwards downstairs, uh, tripping on dog toys in a house. There's a lot of things. And I'm not here to belittle the, the, the accidents that take place when people spill stuff off of a counter. Uh, I, I'm not. Um, my only concern is we're going to go open up a Pandora's box because what took place in the 2023 is that you still have to bring the branch circuit, a small appliance branch circuit, by the way, uh, you still have to bring it to the island or peninsula, but you can put it in a junction box and don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to install it there. Now, if somebody later comes along and somebody says, you know what, I do need a receptacle on my island or peninsula, um, and the junction box is underneath, the electrician's gonna proceed to install the receptacle, right? Well, here's the problem. In the 2023, the ability to install the receptacle below the countertop no longer exists. So it has to be, if you want to install one at the island or peninsula, then it has to be above the countertop. Now, it can be in the countertop and pop up. Uh, it can be one of those ones that pop up from the side. Uh, it can be up to 20 inches above the countertop, that normal 20 inch height still there above a counter. It just can't be below anymore. So we don't no longer worry about the six inch overhang from the base. We don't worry about down 12 inches. Believe it or not, that is totally removed. And again, I'm, I'm not in the field anymore, okay? So I'm not installing it. So again, I, I have no fight in this except for, um, I think that we can't protect people from themselves as much as we want to. Um, and so when I'm in the kitchen and I got a crock pot on there and I'm plugging the receptacle into the side, maybe it's my responsibility to pull the slack back on that cord and, and keep it from just hanging over. I mean, at some point we have to take responsibility. Um, if you've got little kids in the house, uh, maybe that's a reason that we don't require currently in a dwelling to put those little protectors inside of all the receptacles. Well, like you do in other places. Um, you know, we do have tamper resistant now that's designed to help protect. I get it. We're trying to protect people, but I don't know because I'm going to be honest with you. And I've talked to quite a few electricians since this came out and I asked them, what are you going to do when you go back to, to add a receptacle in an island for a customer uh, after the 2023 code? Um, and there's nowhere to install it, but on the side, where are you going to put it? And 100% of the people I talked to told me, I'm going to put it on the side. I'm like, but you can't. They go, well, then I'm not going to get an inspection and I'm going to put it on the side. So my only concern here, and again, I have no dog in the pony in the race. I have no dog in the fight. And I understand there's people way more passionate than me about it. Um, I just don't think in this case that you do any justice by removing the receptacle from the side. Um, yes, there's reports of accidents. And I'm, again, I'm not here to belittle that. But I think you creating that, that Pandora's box where people are going to be doing installations and not calling for inspections. Uh, and I think you're going to actually get jurisdictions are going to amend this out uh, or add a provision uh, to be able to follow the same way you could in the 2020 code uh, in that way. Uh, if it's totally flat across the top, now you can't put one down below the countertop. It just is what it is. So let's go look at the code real quick so that you can kind of see what it is in the code because there are people out there say, Paul, I know you're full of it. You're making this up. No, I'm not. And we'll go look at it. All right. So we're here and I'm going to go on down to 52 and we'll go on and get down here to right here. Okay. So as you see, it, this was dealing with C2 and C3 uh, in the, the 2020. Okay. Um, so we're going to go down a little bit right here. So here's the island in peninsula countertops and work surfaces. Okay. And then here's the location. Here's where those receptacles can be located. 
on those island and peninsula countertops or work surfaces. So let me read it here. Notice, and there's a word in here, or a very short two-letter word that is very impactful. It says, receptacle outlets, if, if, if installed to serve an island or peninsular countertop or work surface, shall be installed in accordance with 210.52C3. Okay, so here's C3 right here. So here's how you got to install it. It says, if a receptacle outlet is not provided, means you're not, you're not, you're not just not putting one in. If it's not provided to serve the island or peninsula countertop or work surface, provisions shall be provided at the island or peninsula for future addition of receptacle outlets to serve the island or peninsula countertop or work surface. Okay, translation, folks. Even if you've got this $20,000 set of cabinets, and we know how this, here's how I believe this really. So I understand there's some passionate people out there I highly respect who talk about lives that were lost and all that kind of, I get it. Um, but I also remember it was the same people that were arguing why we needed more receptacles years ago. Same people. Um, but I want to point out something that it, it to me is kind of kind of significant in how this is, is that even though I don't install the receptacle outlet, I still have to take the circuit there, put it in a junction box for somebody to come along later and install it in accordance with 210.52C3, okay? So here's what it says. It says, where are those receptacle outlets permitted to be located? Okay, well... Receptive outlets shall be located in one or more of the following. One or above, but not more than 20 inches above the countertop or work surface. Okay. Number two, in a countertop using receptive outlet assemblies listed for use in countertops. So they either, they'll pop up, they'll rotate up. You know, remember, you can't install them face up. So they'll rotate up or they actually will pop up out of it. Now, you can't use the ones that cord and plug into a receptacle below the counter. Um, they have to be listed for this application, so they're going to be hardwired. And they basically pop up from the countertop. Well, the biggest issue that people argued, and this is the funniest thing, the Home Builders Association tried to put in a last-minute revision here uh, to say, look, let's add back the ability to put it below. Well, they probably were the ones that were really cheering for it not being in the cabinets, because the problem was, where do you put it? A lot of these high end, you have your, your builders who say the owner doesn't want a receptacle because they got all these nice cabinets around and they all this nice pretty woodwork. They don't want to taint it by you cutting a hole in the side of it. And we're like, well, I can't put it on the top. So I've got to put it on the side. That's the way you did it in 2020. Well, that was the argument from the home builders and people who didn't want it there because of their real expensive islands. Well, now we come full circle. Now they got their way, but even they submitted something to at the last minute to try to get this changed to the code council to add back a, the ability to be able to put it below the countertop because they realized that people are going to be doing stuff and not pulling permits and it's problematic. Okay. And I get the safety issue, the people talking about the cords. I get it. Look, I'm not downplaying it. <coughs> but again, you can't save everybody from everything. And a, 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 you know, parent has to be responsible. People have to be responsible. What this is going to do is it's going to go back to encouraging extension cords, the little brown ones from the countertop over to the islands, uh, which is a problem we had years ago for uh, maybe holidays where they put a hot plate out there or something because now there's no receptacle there. There's no room on the counters. So I just see this happening. And again, I, I just think that you also are going to get issues where people don't pull permits. So anyway, here's that one. And then the third way here is in a work surface using receptacle outlet assemblies listed for use in work surfaces or listed for use in countertops. So we've got the countertop and we've got the work surface, things like that, okay? So you don't have the provision anymore, right? And if I can show you, if it shows the change, right? 
here was the change, and I wanted to show you. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's giving the full change of the whole thing. So yeah, that, that, maybe one of the little downsides with Link. Let's see if it's the wrong one. Let me go to this one real quick. Let's go to this one. And let's see if this change, view change. Okay, right here. Okay, right here. See right here? Below the countertop or work surface. Not more than 12 inches below the countertop or work surface. Subsequent install below the countertop or work surface shall not be located where the countertop or the work surface extends more than six feet beyond the support base. Okay, that was 2020. Just to signify to you, it is not there anymore. So please, after 2023, you guys go out there to do an inspection. Okay, do me a favor. Don't put it below the countertop and not pull a permit. If you need to have them put it in the countertop, it might mean that you lose the use of one whole drawer, or maybe you can locate it between the drawers. I don't know, but you're gonna have to cut that top counter. You're not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. You tell the customer you need to bring in a, a tile person or somebody and they can cut it. I'm not cutting it as an electrician, whether it's the pop-up square or the ones that pop up, I'm not doing it. Call me whatever you want. I'm not messing with somebody's tile. I'm not messing with somebody's granite or whatnot in order to be compliant. You and I both know what's going to happen. Because you ran that circuit. So my solution is don't require any branch circuit to come to the island or peninsula. Don't give them that temptation. If you don't want one there, then just don't take the circuit there. Okay? Whatever. All right, so anyway... It's my opinion on it. I really didn't want to get opinionated in that, but you know, is what it is. I know there's some people that are real passionate about it. I just think that what do you 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 trying to save some incidents, rare incidents? We got millions and millions of people out there, and I know it's sad when somebody gets hurt, but sadly, I think you're going to create more problems with people doing work without permits, shoddy work. I'll leave it alone. Okay, the last one for this episode is new requirements for receptacle outlets and show windows. Okay, that is 210.52. Let's go look at it. 210.52, excuse me, 62. Why did I say 52? 62, I got 52 on my mind, folks. All right, here you go. So show windows. It says at least one 125 volt single phase 15 or 20 amp rated receptacle outlet shall be installed within 18 inches of the top of each show window. If you have multiple show windows, then you have to have one within 18 inches of each show window at the top. Okay. Then it says no point along the top of the window shall be farther than six feet from a receptacle outlet. Okay. So you've got to put them what? Every show window, it has to be at least one installed within 18 inches for each show window, okay? And of course, if you're measuring linearly, it, no point along the top of a window shall be farther than six feet from a receptacle outlet. So no higher than 18 inches, right? Okay, has to be installed within 18 inches. Okay, so it's gotta be within 18. And if it's a long show window, you're gonna have multiples because at no point, along the top of a show window, can you be more than six feet from a receptacle outlet, okay? And let's see here, if we look at the change, here's what it said previously, it says at least one 125 volt single phase, 15 or 20 ampere rated receptacle outlet shall be installed within 18 inches of the top of a show window. And it said for each 12 linear feet or major fraction thereof of show window area, measured horizontally along its maximum length. So the change is no point along the top of the show window shall be farther than six feet from a receptacle outlet. So if you're looking above there and you have uh, a, so to me it'd be, if it was a 12 foot show window, then I could put one in the middle. And again, less than 18 inches. And it would be within six feet of that end of the show window, six feet of that end of the show window, okay? way I'm looking at it, okay? 
All right, let's bring it back to me. All right, certainly not all of the changes that took place in 210, um, but those are the ones we want to call out that are you know, fairly significant that you need to be aware of. Uh, there should be no substitute, folks, for cracking open your code book and actually looking at the changes that are taking place. Uh, even if you attend a code change seminar um, and you're listening to somebody tell you the different things, a lot of us are going to kind of cover the surface and not go overly deep uh, because, again, usually with code updates, it's for licensing renewal, and they're basically trying to uh, get as many in you as possible in the whatever the time frame is for that renewal for that state. Uh, when it comes to me like videos, I got to kind of keep them shorter so that they're palatable for you to be able to absorb them and not go nuts because I can ramble on and on and on and on. I get it. You you know, all you out there that give the snarky comments, you're not telling me nothing I don't already know. So, you know, it doesn't hurt my feelings. OK, you just, you know, if you watched it and you don't like my content, then I just took 120, uh, uh, almost an hour and a half of your life. You'll never get back. You're welcome. All right, folks, that's it. Those are the ones that I think are significant for Article 210. Till next time, stay safe. God bless.